Kathy Vick, Deeply Awake, Chats 2017. Um, I want to uh, give this to you today. I thought that I was complete, but there's something that is so urgent, and I just need to say it. And that is a little talk that I want to uh, clarify and give away called Psychosis and Enlightenment. And we must start at the very beginning, which is a, a great equalizer of a thought and the God's honest truth. The psychotic drowns in the same water the mystic swims in. So those people who suffer uh, behavioral, legal, uh, and social consequences for their uh, behavior, which may be disordered due to disordered thinking and feeling and uh, spiritual understanding, you would need to understand that uh, you have a sister, okay? And I, the crows have already come to me. They came to me in 14 and told me what uh, one of the tasks I have in front of me. And I saw pictures, and that's something that I said okay to. And, of course, I thought it was to be done right then. And I was very upset that it didn't happen, and upset that I didn't follow through, and upset, upset, upset. Okay, well, here it is. Hello, crows. <laughs> so, um, you're not alone. And if you think you're going crazy because you're seeing visions or because your heart is opening up and you're seeing people differently or you're feeling a crap ton of stuff that you've never felt before and it's pretty uncomfortable and scarier than hell, well, <laughs> that's what this is all about. So my work has been uh, to kind of step by step, day by day, walk through a process of deciding am I crazy or not basically and um, is this it does this have any validity it, it wasn't just well can you monetize it oftentimes it was a life-and-death struggle whether this was gonna get out really even only like I don't know nine twelve months ago I had dinner with my dad one night and it was during that time he was very worried about me, very worried about me. And I was normal, I was doing fine. But it was just, and, and he, he really spent the whole evening pounding at home that I was sick and I needed to get on antipsychotics. This was not acceptable. And you know, when you've got that right up close and personal, it's really hard. Especially when you yourself are convinced that you've finally gone around the bend. I can remember being in nursing school the first few weeks and I had a burst of so much creativity and I was seeing visions. It was bizarre. And I, I told my sister about it and she was really not okay with that. And I knew I was on my own, and I knew I had some questions in front of me. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know. It was before I met the teachers. It was 1985. No, 83. It was 22. I didn't know what was going on. And I, because of my family being so crazy, I mean, take it to the bank, hardcore, crazy, all the way down the line, on my dad's side. Uh, I, I knew to be crazy is to be bad and, and, and unacceptable. And I have actually, part of me is always identified as being crazy. And really, truly convinced that all I have to do is open my mouth and start talking and I would be sent away. And so I, I can remember very, very early seeing a documentary, I was 12 or 13, and I saw mental institutions and I, and I saw, and I was with my, sis, with my, my mom and, uh, and my aunt and uh, I, I excused myself and went into my room and I was panicked because I realized 
that I could be taken away. I was a normal kid. I was a happy kid. I just did kickball and I was a normal, good student. I was normal as all hell. And there I was quaking in fear. And I think it really did bring up this this innate feeling I had that if, if you're mentally ill, you are harmful to other people. You are not supposed to be doing that. And so this negation that I, I learned very, very early, that it's those who go out, who take pleasure in hurting others or who don't care that they hurt others, but who are harm itself. They're mentally ill. Everyone else is crazy. They, they are dangerous. And then when I began to recouple their stuff, you know, he's seeing that the people just called him crazy. And then I see a mental institution show. It's like, whoa, whoa. So, because um, I'd always been able to have visions and stuff as a kid. So for me, it was really scary. And then, you know, here I am, 55 or 56, and there's my dad saying, yeah, you really, I'm, I'm frightened for you. Really, I'm still, really, I'm still going through this, and I, part of me sat there frightened. But most of me just reared up on my legs and said, no, no, that's fine, you can think that. But I felt so negated. I felt just like completely minimized and seen as a disease. That the biggest, most beautiful, most important, most foundational part of me was being seen as a disease. Well, I think that's what we do to schizophrenics and manics and bipolar and, you know, um, BPDs and MPDs and all of that. We've, uh, we've, we've, the medical model is you present with symptoms and from those symptoms and those, uh, the, the tests that can be done, um, this data creates a picture, a, a diagnostic picture is often what it's called. And then uh, the, the, the psychiatric people use a tool called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistics Manual. And now they're on DSM-5. But then someone will present and complain about this or that or behave a certain way and completely deny <laughs> their behavior, although they're behaving that way. And you go, doot, 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 tick, 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 pa, 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 all the algorithms, and you go, and you get a diagnosis. You cannot treat without a diagnosis. That's how medica medical people work. But in psych, it's different. Or is it? If you make everything a problem that can be, that can be measured, and you can throw something at it, and then if the person doesn't respond, it's, they, it's because they're deficient. And so the responsibility for healing is more like giving someone a treatment that may actually disagree with them and giving them a, a swift kick if it doesn't take. Oh, there's no help for you then. <laughs> it's just like, what? And it's just getting worse and worse. What they're doing with painkillers is just crazy. Can I just say, okay, create a monster, why don't you? Create a monster, a big one, that like the nation of nurses and doctors have to deal with every single day now. Drug-seeking because people are in pain. So what do they do? Well, sometimes they somaticize their pain and sometimes they just know they're in some kind of pain and they need relief. They need pain killer. So they get on that tit and then they have some changes in their personality which are not very pleasant because addicts are not real, really enjoyable to be around. And um, then they're pissed off at what they've created. It's just classic wizard and monster stuff. It's classic. It's crazy. That's medicine. And, and, and unfortunately anymore, any, any standing apart from the allopathic model is gone now with psychiatry. It's, it's really turned into something that's um, <laughs> really ineffective. So sad. So sad. 
And we languish, all of us, we languish with our pains in our hearts and our unanswered spiritual questions that manifest as dreams that frighten us into doing odd things and thoughts that come that are so assertive and we begin to create whole understandings around these thoughts and and we wonder, is, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Well, there's nobody to check with. Unless you start realizing that maybe some of this is uh, spiritual. And that's what's happening to people is they're realizing they're going through a spiritual awakening, not a mental illness. And um, so I want to tell you that for me, I, I came from the deep freeze, man. I mean, I, I, I got divorced in 2003, a single mom with a three-year-old, and I had to I had to find a way to manage, and, and, and I was not good at that kind of stuff. And I wasn't that great of a mom, and I just felt completely overwhelmed and so tasked to do it right. It was not pop, I couldn't do it wrong. And I didn't realize that I couldn't do it wrong. I was just so scared all the time scared and this is after five years of just industrial grade domestic violence just really awful fewer years than that thank Christ and um three and I had lost my faith in myself my trust in God I, I was in a, a, a deep estrangement with my soul after that and you know what better place to go than within and it, it created a time when I needed to just I knew I was to step away from relationships and romance and sexuality and just events and socializing and uh, it was a very very good time some could have seen that and said I had had a break some saw it and proclaimed that so. But I was always gentle with myself and I always knew I was a writer. I had something to create that was far bigger than what people could see at any given day. And they didn't understand. And even though I told people and I had the, I had the proof because I could sit down and write anything. They made fun of me. Because I wasn't that already. I was in process. I wasn't complete. And it was just nasty. And it went on for years. And like I've said, at the end of 2011, things began to get loose. But I began to see things. But it wasn't just seeing things. My whole body was involved. My whole being was involved and when I'd come back from something like that I was different and it kept happening and kept happening and kept happening now I know I have some you can check my natal chart out it's it's very clear that I'm I'm keyed to be triggered like that and have big awakenings okay Pluto retrograde first house all right so I was it was my purpose to come in and transform it was then I finally had the language from the teachers clarifying that it wasn't some freaking Judeo-Christian weird thing this was scientific this is planetary evolution this is simply ascension dear and going into a deep freeze for many many years from 94 To that October evening in 2011 and then everything woke up and I began to have a looseness in my in my awareness and I began to have guidance is that hearing voices when it's ringing in my bones yeah I suppose but I had known I had known I had friends who had guidance and they would just shrug off and say yeah what's them they say blah blah they say blah blah and it was just normal so I had that as all of this came down I had I had 
I had the way my dear friend always handled her guidance, which was very nonchalant and accepting. And then other people began to flood into my reality. Somehow I just opened the door and all these people started to come in, all these new ideas. And I was starting to feel better, all the time feel better. And I could really t begin to tell that there was a difference between how I'd been and where I was. And I knew it was good. And I knew it was weird. And I knew for myself I needed to document it. Because I tried to tell the people around me. And I was punished. It wasn't good at all. It wasn't good to speak about it. I learned to shut up about it, but I really couldn't, so I started to write. And then in 2014, I encountered someone who was okay with it. And, it, and, and, I, and I loved him, so it was easy to feel better about myself. And it was good to create something like that. And then there were many, many sad things that happened, many, many ruptures and disruptions and losses and fears realized and uh, trauma revisited and misunderstandings finally understood. And at the beginning of this videotape process, you know, they told me about the return. And it was just, it's just physics. But look at how it's going to be. Because they taught me how to run my energy. I never thought about it, but I was only running it out of my right and going around like that. And they said, okay, we'll try it the other way. And I did that, and phew, big, huge flower lotus thing blossomed in, into beautiful geometrics while I was just standing in this big circle before an ecstatic dance. And then um, then they said, okay, now run both ways. And I did. And I could see how the energy would go around and how I felt when it was farthest away from me. And then I saw with increased excitement and apprehension and joy how it was coming like that. And it was like oh, a supernova. And they said, that's the return. <laughs> it's just physics. But it will have an effect. So, I don't know. I mean, what is really beautiful to me now is that when I have spoken and moved the energy somehow, then it's like the door opens a little bit more. A little bit more. And, um... And I'll think it's I'll I'll even have a thought and then I'll go to the I'll go to online and it's like oh there's my thought and I learn more and I learn more and it's like that every day it doesn't matter if I'm working a twelve hour shift it doesn't matter if I am cooking for my family it doesn't matter if I'm in the middle of chanting it doesn't matter it's always there now. So uh, this idea of using antipsychotics, um, it's not a great idea, guys. I would say if you are not blooming into some sort of uh, very, very weird oddness that includes really being physically unwell for a, quite a while and you're, you know, less than 16, um, then get yourself to a shaman anyway. But uh, you're not blossoming into schizophrenia, okay? What I've seen recently in the psychiatric community or in the medical community is that they have gotten rid of schizophrenia. Uh, I don't know. It must be for, because the DSM-5 has changed uh, the, uh, the diagnostic algorithms. But they're using um, a phrase that we didn't use very often called... Um, um, <clears throat> uh, what did we call it? it? was when we found weird people. It was the weird person diagnosis. Oh, schizoaffective. 
They're calling everybody ski so effective now. So if you go into the doctor and you start talking about visions and shit like that, and then you get handed some pills, and then you find out your diagnosis is ski so effective, well, I'd say it might be a good idea to rethink where you're at. I remember when I started to have visions in about 86, but they were accompanied by fear. And I would be physically ill, and there were certain tasks that were required for for daily life, and I couldn't complete them without being completely triggered into a state of uh, horror and panic. And I didn't understand any of it, but all I knew was that I was seeing shadows and having my body freak out on me when I wanted to do this simple thing. So of course I went to a shrink and of course he said that I was psychotically depressed. And he handed me antidepressants and thank God for them. About, uh, oh, oh, I don't know, six or eight weeks in with very little hope that I'd ever feel any better and that I was just at baseline. I remember and being in my living room and I stared at, I was looking at the TV and it, the, there was no programming on, but I was looking at the TV and all of a sudden this feeling came over me. And I realized I was happy. That I felt okay. And it wasn't going away immediately. And I knew in a flash, oh, this is how people feel all the time. This explains a lot. I wouldn't mind being he- being here if I felt like this. And so I stayed on those. And uh, it wasn't until 2012 that I, w- I removed myself from all therapeutic uh, pharmaceuticals. But even then, at that time, before I lost my insurance and my money, and I, my back against the, was against the wall, and I realized maybe I needed to find another way I had been on Wellbutrin, hormones, um, both kinds. Um, I had I had been on a lot of um, morphine at one point, MS Cotton, because my pain was so bad. I wasn't on that at the time, but I was on a ton of neur- uh, Neurontin. Lots and lots of drugs. And they went away out of necessity, and that included my psychoactives, and I was worried. But I found that there was a buoyancy in my internal process that there hadn't been before, and there was less fear. I wasn't afraid of myself. I wasn't afraid of other people because I was beginning to see positive effect from these hallucinations, basically, these experiences. I didn't ever call them hallucinations, although recently I have called them that, and I I have come to coin them visions, but I oftentimes would just say that it was a meditation. Um, but it's a, it's a full-on event. The thing is that when your pineal starts opening up, well then you can't talk to a shrink about that unless their pineal's been open. You know? I laid down on my bed, it was in 2012, and I, and I, and it didn't hurt, but I laid down one night and all of a sudden the inside of my head cracked. It was a big crack, and I could hear it, and it was weird. It wasn't bad, it wasn't hurtful, but it was weird. And I didn't have any kind of wild uh, visions after that, but they got better. And what happened to me is that my senses began to merge, so um, when I see a, a color, I often will see a... I was gonna. I, I was seeing a number, and I was gonna say when I see a number, I often see a color. But I said I, I when I see a color. So there are some things that just went away right away. Linear planning and executive function. Well, you know what? That's what demented people have. And schizophrenics. Well, they are symbolic in their thinking and language. There's some mean things that go on inside of that mental health thing, and one of them is ideas of reference. So shaman, listen up. It's it's pernicious, and it speaks. It speaks to not understanding anything. 
when someone who's wide open and doesn't know what the hell to do about it and is probably acting out as a result because they're having bad stuff happen to inside of them and maybe these bad it was okay then they'll be called that they have ideas of reference which means that they see TV shows or magazines or clouds and they think it's about them you know it's not all about you that's sort of you know what what they say to mentally ill. It's all about you. <laughs> I'm not saying mentally ill people are a picnic to be around, okay? But um, the idea of reference, well, that's 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 playing hand to hand combat. I mean, okay, I an idea of reference. If that's a bad thing, I had to get over that right away. I see myself in everything, and it's freaky deaky. I mean, weird. But if you, then I began to realize the plasticity of identity, and I began to realize, you know, about oversouls and about about parallel realities and about um, merged realities and, and soul sharing and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you don't have the equipment, you don't have the infrastructure. You're going to see some of these things and be freaked out by it. You know. And what if you see demons or that kind of thing? So here's the deal. When you're be with somebody who's mentally ill or having their own demons, and I would always say, hey, you want to be around me? Here's the deal. you got to manage yourself. you got to know how to manage yourself, and then you have to manage yourself. If you can do that and you can be decent and honest, then, hey, I don't care what diagnosis you carry. But it is not. It is will never be an excuse to take advantage of me, to lie to me, or to be cruel. That's not managing yourself or your illness as you see it. So I don't care what you've got. Come along, but manage yourself. I learned this in psychiatric facilities where it's like, you know, I remember one time talking to a psychologist who was a manager of a unit and we were talking about this guy who was still having, you know, hallucinations, auditory and visual hallucinations. And I was reporting that and and and, and, and I was thinking, well, that, that, you know, that's not a good thing. And the guy said, well, it, uh, do these hallucinations bother him? I said, no. They, they add color, but they're not, they, they don't frighten him. And he said, well, good, that's fine. That's fine. Some people see and hear that kind of stuff. As long as it's not scaring them, it's fine. And I'm really glad he said that because it allowed it allowed me to see things differently. And, um, and that's kind of how I tried to manage myself, too. If I'm going to be falling apart here, um, am I being cruel? And sometimes in my great misunderstanding and dealing with stuff, yes, I was cruel. You better believe it I was cruel yep and sometimes the people who didn't deserve it and I only have to do that once in a lifetime to feel like a piece of shit for the whole rest of the way but you know a, a moment's lack of control it's important to manage it and to not harm others to not harm others if you need medication so that you need so that the the desire and requirement to harm self or others is removed for a time that's fine that's good that's playing it smart and safe it's not time to be discussing how we're going to treat people in the future it's time to reach out and say hey if you're seeing things hearing things smelling things for like a year and a half, almost every night, almost every single night, I smelled Thanksgiving dinner. Every single night. And I used to think, wow, somebody somebody who lives in the on this on this floor really knows how to live right. No. No. So the sense is uh, uh, um, begin to have plasticity and, and connection. The brain begins to rewire. And here's the thing. When internally some of these things come online, which is part of the process, 
you're not falling apart because you're going to fall, be falling apart forever. That's the thing. If you're crazy, that's a death sentence or a life sentence. If you're mentally ill, do you ever recover? No. You're born flawed. You're born dirty. You're born broken. And who do you have to go to to get better? Into a system that requires you to do what? Petition for forgiveness. It's a very, very, very shaming system. What does that sound like? Does that sound like a creator God that says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make all these people, and then they're made. And, and the creator God says, hey, hey, you might have noticed, but let me just fill you in in case you don't know. You guys, you're all broken. And the people say, yeah, yeah, we noticed that. We're fucked up. And the creator God says, yeah, well, um, here's the deal. Do you want to get better? Well, yeah, yeah, we're broken. And the creator God knows that they're not going to ever get well because they haven't asked the central question. Why did you make us broken? Why? But the creator God says, yeah, well, I made you in my image, but here's the deal. It doesn't matter. Here's the deal. You can get well. You can be healed. The only thing you need to do is to petition me for forgiveness. Through whatever, the cross or, you know, whatever. What? Well, this sickness is, is played out in many different forms. And that, that what they've done to Christianity is just like it's getting grosser and grosser. The idea of a cross around, it's, I've always called it a, a death cult, but I never really understood just the degree of perversion. Oh, God, such a beautiful message and so much darkness. Ooh. So, um, and you know, there, it's, it, is, it is really, there's actually a word for it, religiosity. Not uncommon for people to walk in and say they're Jesus Christ. Well, of course they are. They're being touched with monumental energy and they petition a system that can't recognize their divinity. Well, okay, there you go. All the system can do is label, name call, and um, extinguish, sedate, make safe, manage. So um, I think that it's a reflection of our uh, not really understanding ourselves, and that's why it's at this point inappropriate to say, well, this is what I think should happen to that system. Because I think as a group, we're all going to take a look at that. That's what I keep getting. After the eclipse, it's going to be like, if you ever want a light bulb to go on in a really dark room that you kind of like to know what's in there, yeah, this is it. And it may go off for some people right away. That's fine. You only need to take one look. <laughs> That's it. If, if you are in utter blackness and for a flash there's light. You can never really know blackness again. And you'll always go toward the light. Always. Because we're made of light. So that's what's happening. Isn't it lovely? So, um, I, I, uh, antipsychotics work in, you know, in, in the brain, antidepressants work in the brain in such a way that um, certain neurotransmitters are uh, encouraged to stay idle, others are increased to, to uh, an uptake uh, level that is, is significant. But the idea here is that what no one talks about is that serotonin, dopamine, Norepinephrine, these neurotransmitters, we all have been led to believe that they are made in the brain. Further, we are made to believe that there is a finite amount in our body, and so if you can, it's, it's, that's it, that's a finite amount. Closed system. Closed system of happiness. Yeah, that's a lie. The gut produces these neuro, neuro, neurotransmitters. You think maybe nutrition might be important? Yeah. Purity of food? 
purity of thought, purity of conduct. You think they might be connected? And so the idea that uh, these the mentally ill are the whipping boys, well, that's always been the case. And as more and more people appear to have psychotic episodes, not breaks, episodes, please, please, consider that you're having a spiritual awakening. You're going through an enlightenment. You're seeing things that you are very uncomfortable with and your mind is rebelling. And you haven't been given very many tools or have not been many tools about. And what we have been told as a group is that if you go over around the bend, you don't come back. Untrue. Untrue. And so we'll show people and we'll demonstrate and we'll assist and we'll stand as examples. So that's all I have to say about psychosis and enlightenment at this time. If you're having a sparkly experience as well, then don't label yourself. And if you're fearing that you're crazy, well then, you're not. And if you are, so what? What does it mean? What does that label crazy mean? That you're not going to be loved, that you're set apart, that you're not part of the group, and that you'll never be accepted. Ever. It's a life sentence. It's bullshit. Take your seat. At the head of the table. And let your cup runneth over and let your hand be guided by those around you who are overjoyed that you finally let them in. Ask for help internally. Trust that you're guided because you are. When we feel we are breaking apart, disintegrating, anybody seen that movie Lucy? that scene in the airplane cabin? I've been there. Have you? There's strength in numbers. Mental illness, that whole system requires isolation. It requires stigma. Stig stigma. It requires it. And the only person who can destigmatize you is you. And the way I did that was, hey, you're right. I look broke down. You're right. It's kind of scary. You're right. I'm flying without very many, uh, very many feathers on my wings right now. You're right. It's kind of scary. You're right. I'm not managing very well right now. You're right. And now I would, I would be able to think in my mind and you're staying still. And that's why you're noticing. But I just felt deficient. It was just another nail in the self-esteem coffin until I realized that perhaps I wasn't nuts after all. Perhaps I was touched. And perhaps everything would work out in the end. Because that's what I always knew. And I, I, I thought that was a delusion but I was willing to accept it as mine. There was a point to all of this, that the suffering was uh, purposeful, beautiful, and uh, spiritual, and that what would come didn't matter if it was this lifetime or next lifetime or the lifetime after that, but I would finally know peace. I would finally understand and I would finally become myself. So I, I don't know. I'm wondering if the person who is, um, uh, you know, 
sitting there thinking about what's for lunch and um, you know talking with their loved one about their mortgage payment and they're listening to a psychotic ramble on and they've never had an awakening they've never had what you're going through do you really expect them to lead you through safely they can't see what you can see but you're going to let them guide you You're being guided from within. And if you trust that, it's weird. You will be guided to people without who will have answers for you, who will be like full-on triggers for you. You'll get what you need. And you'll get hooked up with people who are going to make you glow. And then you can decide how you feel about that. And keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. This time or next, don't matter. We're all on that road, you know. And I'm kind of tired of just keep talking about it. I'm really looking forward to the eclipse. <laughs> It'll be different after that. I don't have to worry about that. So, I got two weeks. So do you. Live it well. In peace. In harmony. If you can. And if you can't, fine. Live it out loud. Live it honestly. It's just all about living it at this point. It's just living it. Go for it. Alright. That's all for today. Thanks.